Revelation tells us of seven churches. I had the privilege of visiting most of the archaeological sites of the seven churches in Turkey with Francois. And now I have a better understanding and more appreciation for the messages to those churches. Listen while Francois tells us about the first two churches, Ephesus and Smyrna. Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what soon must take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. And then we read these triumphant words in verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Don't you think this is exciting? Jesus is coming again to take us to heaven. And we must start preparing ourselves for this marvellous trip through space. Our journey through the pages of this last book of the Bible is going to be exciting. We will discover God's plan to save sinners in a very unique manner. Listen to the words of verse 8. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. According to tradition, the persecuting Romans placed John into boiling oil. Because God preserved his life miraculously, he was banned to the island of Patmos. When I visited this beautiful island, I thought of a vision John received one Sabbath morning. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. During this lecture we are going to visit some of the sites of these ancient churches. I've made some exciting archaeological and spiritual discoveries which I'm going to share with you. The letters addressed to these historical churches have a threefold application. First of all, we have the local application, then we have a prophetic application, which stretches from the time of Christ to the end of the world. But the most important application is the personal one. God wants to speak to your heart and mine. According to tradition, John received his visions in this specific cave. It was here that God revealed to his apostle the end time events. I was emotionally touched when I walked in here. Revelation chapter 1 verses 12 to 16. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone, like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. What a revelation! Previously, John only saw Jesus as the lowly son of a carpenter who walked amongst hurting, dying people. But now John sees his master in all the majesty and panoply of divine glory. Let us devote a little more time to the study of the life of Jesus in all his beautiful salvation facets. While I looked at the different places that one can visit on the island of Patmos, I thought of the scope of the messages of this book. Verse 19 gives us the key that unlocks the mystery of the book. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. How many tenses did you notice? It's the past, the present, and the future. 
verse 20 says, The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. We are going to look at the seven prophetic time slots of the seven churches. The first one begins with a cross and the last one ends with the second coming of Christ. Turkey was previously called Asia Minor. The seven cities were situated on one of the well-travelled ancient Roman roads of the day. The distance between them ranged from 50 to 70 kilometres. In the museum at Ephesus one can view this model of the ancient city. In New Testament times a little gulf provided shelter for incoming ships. Today it is all silted up. To the far left is the mound on which rests the tomb of the great apostle John, the one who wrote the book of Revelation. Before we read the message to the church of Ephesus, let us pause for just a moment at the place where John was buried. You know, this man was initially called the son of thunder, but Christ changed his life and made him an apostle of love. God still wants to change unkind people into kind people. I took my daughter into the ancient baptismal font and reminded her of the story of John's conversion. Baptism celebrates God's power to change lives. On a specific day, a man arrived here at Ephesus with a letter from John the Beloved Apostle. Everybody was informed about the mail from Patmos and this is the message that was read on the following Sabbath. Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's visit the ancient site of Ephesus while we think about the message to these people. Unfortunately, we do not have enough time to explore all the interesting sites of the city. We will only be looking at a few and concentrate on aspects that will strengthen our faith in the Bible. As I was strolling down Arcadian Street, which runs from the harbour to the great theatre, I saw this shrine. If you take a close look at it, you will notice a multi-breasted figure of a woman. Guess who she was? Diane or Artemis. Salesmen sold thousands upon thousands of these little figurines. Buyers took them home where they venerated the goddess of Diane. But then suddenly the sales dropped. What caused the slump in business? Let me tell you the story. The early Christians took the good news of Jesus, the Son of God who died for sinners, who arose, who intercedes, and who is coming again for pagan Ephesus. Aquila and Priscilla were among the first of the missionaries. Then came Apollo and preached to the heathen to be in Christ, to be like him, so that they could be with him one day. The Holy Spirit convinced them of the sin of idolatry and they began worshipping and serving God. And then came Paul and he added his appeal to the other missionaries to serve the living Christ. His messages concerning Jesus Christ, the Saviour of mankind, were so powerful 
that the Ephesians ceased buying images of Artemis. Demetrius, a silversmith who was financially crippled by the drop in sales, instigated a city protest. He managed to fill this huge theatre with thousands of angry Ephesians. It was quite an experience when I first climbed these steps where 25,000 spectators could be seated. Acts chapter 19 verse 34 tells us that the huge crowd shouted non-stop for two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Fortunately, the town clerk brought them back to their senses. He suggested that Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen take the matter to court. Towards the close of Paul's stay in Ephesus, he wrote the first letter to the church in Corinth. Please read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It tells us how love operates and behaves. Let me tell you something about the pastor who lived in Ephesus at the time when the letter from Patmos was delivered to this church. This man was appointed by the great apostle Paul himself to care for this flock. When Paul was stoned at Lystra, a young man by the name of Timothy was a witness. The life of Paul and the message he preached made such an impression upon him that he decided to follow Jesus all the way. When I stood here at Ephesus looking at the beautiful surroundings, I thought of the inspired message that was delivered here so long ago. Let's read it again. Chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Who is this angel? Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 says he is a messenger or pastor of the church. Jesus holds him in the palm of his hand and calls him a star. I wish I could have seen Timothy's face when he read these words. God likes to compliment people for their good deeds like prayer, Bible study and witnessing. Let's follow his example and be a little more generous with our compliments. But because he loves us so dearly, he is very honest with us. He will also reprimand us if he thinks we need to improve. Before reading about his counsel, let's look at another commendation he made in verse 6. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Please note that God does not hate people, but he hates their evil deeds. Who were these Nicolaitans? What do the historians tell us about them? You are looking at the address of a prostitute who used to live here in Timothy's time. Irenaeus, a second century minister who grew up near Ephesus, referred to the Nicolaitans in one of his writings. He said they claimed to be Christians but considered it a matter of indifference to practice adultery. Does this sound familiar? We call it antinomianism. That means somebody that's against God's law. In other words, the Nicolaitans were professed Christians who felt that faith in Jesus released them from obedience to some of the commandments. When I stood in this ancient baptismal font at Ephesus, I felt a little sad. Many fine Christians who were baptized here justified their immoral behavior. May God help you and me to hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, but care for our immoral friends and point them to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. By the grace of God, you and I can live victorious lives. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can obey all His commandments. If we have lost our first love for Him and our neighbors, He will notice it and reprimand us. Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 
Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Has it happened to you lately? Have you lost that warm, loving relationship with the Lord? Don't despair. Listen to God's advice to the Ephesians. Verse 5 Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, Through the law we become conscious of sin. Maybe this is what you and I should do. Go to God's holy law and ask Him to convict us of sin. And once this has happened, go to Jesus for cleansing. One can view the statue of Socrates at the Ephesian Museum. He was the man who said, Human excellence is a state of mind. The Gospel, however, says no. Human excellence is only found in Jesus Christ. If I possess Him, His perfect human excellence becomes my human excellence by faith. Besides the baptismal font at St. John's Church, I also discovered this one amongst the ruins of ancient Ephesus. I'm going to read to you his parting words to the church at Ephesus. Verse 7 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Before I left Ephesus, I asked God to help me overcome my critical spirit because it is so unlike him. I asked him to help me not to bear grudges because he does not bear grudges against me. I asked him to make me a more loving and a lovable Christian. The letter to the Ephesians covers the first hundred years of the history of the Christian church, but fortunately its warnings and encouragements are timeless. The White Horse of Revelation 6 verses 1 and 2 covers the same period as that of the message to the church of Ephesus. We will hear more about it when we discover the amazing symbolism of the first horse, the white one. As we leave Ephesus to move to our next destination, let us remember the messages that came to this church and apply it to our own hearts. We have just arrived at our second destination in Turkey. In Bible times, this city was called Smyrna, which means sweet smelling. When I looked at these ruins, I thought of the thousands of people who were martyred here at Smyrna. Today the Turks call it Ishmir. Let's listen to the contents of the letter that was delivered here some 2,000 years ago. Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 to 11 To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Many centuries ago, people who attended this newly excavated basilica heard the beautiful words that we've just listened to. How did they react? And how do we react when we hear the word of God? Besides listening to the messages given to the little church during John's time, we're also looking at the second prophetic period of the church, which is AD 100 to AD 313. History tells us that this was a time of terrible persecution. And when you look at the red color of the second horse in Revelation 6 verse 3, which covers the same period, you get the message of bloody persecution. In AD 107, Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch in Syria, and a friend of John the Beloved Apostle, was thrown to the lions and eaten alive in the amphitheater at Rome. 
This ancient painting tells the sad story. Polycarp was also born here in Smyrna in AD 69 and later became bishop. He was a disciple of John and a close friend of Ignatius. When asked to renounce his faith in Christ, he said, Eighty-six years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I speak evil of my king who saved me? Polycarp had the honour to be burned at the stake for Christ who died for him on the cross. By the way, if you are suffering innocently, take heart. God knows about it because he went through it himself. The cruel emperor Diocletian established an eastern capital in Nicomedia, the present-day Ishmit. In AD 303, the city was destroyed by fire and just like Nero before him, he too blamed the Christians for doing it. He used this as an excuse for the worst persecution ever to come to the church. The purpose was the total eradication of Christianity from the empire. The bloody years of persecution only came to an end exactly ten years later when Emperor Constantine issued the decree of toleration in AD 313. Let's read Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 again. You will suffer persecution for ten days. How long is a day in a prophetic context? We discovered in our studies from the book of Daniel that one day stands for one year. When the great prophetic clock struck after ten years, the Smyrna period of persecution was ended. Revelation 2 verse 11, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. The Bible calls the first death a sleep, which implies an awakening, a resurrection. Let's ask John himself to explain this phenomenon to us. John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29 says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Two thousand years ago a message was sent from Patmos to the church of Smyrna. It came from John the beloved apostle. The pastor of the church read it to his parishioners, Overcome, and you will not be hurt by the second death. Today, two thousand years later, the message comes echoing down through the passages of time, Overcome, and you will not be hurt by the second death. Are you losing the battle against sin and temptation? Are you desperately longing for some kind of victory? I have good news for you. Jesus was tempted in all points and he overcame every single temptation. He is more than willing to help you. Come to him in your weakness and he will help you overcome in his strength. Bring him your unkindness and he will give you his kindness. Give him your sin-polluted life and he will give you his sinless, perfect, holy life. We will continue our journey to the seven churches in the next presentation.